98 Not Out, sponsored by Shepherd Neem, proud supporters of cricket in Essex. And that's actually especially for our next guest. Uh, welcome to 98 Not Out, Gareth Batty. Gareth, how are you? Very good evening, man. How are we doing? All right. You enjoy that? Absolutely brilliant. I had a little <laughs> sing song to myself in the front room. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. So, how have you been coping during the lockdown? Um, it's uh, look, it's it's tough for everybody, isn't it? But um, I I'm not going to be one of those that harps on. We're very lucky. Family, friends are all all healthy and well, um, so it's not too much hardship for us um, when there are other people out there on the front line doing uh, doing brilliant work. So, um, no, it's uh, it's just a, a very interesting situation we find ourselves, isn't it? Uh, sorry, you haven't been furloughed. Has that made? Uh I mean, other people we've talked to have been furloughed, and it means that they can't train, they can't do anything cricket-related. Have you been able to uh, to keep uh, keep active? Yeah, it's uh, we've been given our program uh, from Daz Vaness, who's, uh, if you ever see a picture of him, he's a big, big strapping bloke. Uh, he used to work the doors up in Birmingham and what have you. Oh, he, knows his, he knows his eggs, from when it, eggs is eggs when it comes to the old fitness stuff. So, unfortunately, an old man like myself, hoping for a bit of feet up time, that hasn't been the case. Um <laughs> We, uh, we fill out an app every day on, on what work we've been doing um, just to try and keep us in some sort of order for hopefully when we get uh, when we get the nod that um, something may happen. This um, rest period, if I can call it that, now for someone such as yourself, and Jimmy Anderson was commenting the other day that it's come at exactly the right time to maybe prolong the career a little bit. Are you sort of thinking along those lines now? <laughs> I guess what you're saying there, with someone like yourself, you mean the older guys. Well, <laughs> um, you're younger than me, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. It, it, you can look at it both ways, can't you? I, I, I'm always... Um, the glass is half full, so I see that, yes, uh, hopefully an, an extra bit of rest period or certain uh, certain time out of the game, the, the high situation, the, the tension of the game, um, and the, the sort of wear and tear on the body should, in theory, allow... Um, a bit more longevity, but uh, the flip side of it is the longer you are not playing um, of an age, you're, you're easier to uh, to sort of be overlooked. Um, so it's um, it's a bit of both, isn't it? Um, I certainly feel pretty fit and, and good to go. Um, and Jimmy's obviously flying the flag for, for the older fellas. I'm obviously <laughs> the, the granddad of, of the old fellas at the minute. Oh, Darren um, Stevens still. Yeah, no, Steve. While Steve is still playing, I'm I'm good to go because I'm not the oldest, which uh, is a, a very nice place to be. You've got a lot of youngsters at Surrey snapping at your heels, haven't you? Um, who are the sort of standouts that uh, you sort of thought? Yeah, I I could have told you five years ago he'd come through. Who are the ones that uh, we should be looking at? Um, the obvious ones that first come on the lips are the current boys, um, who now are fully fledged England yeah. players. Um, but um, there's a young fellow, Will Jacks. Um, who is a, a dynamic batsman and bowls a bit of off spin, um, who has been a little bit of air cricket but um, wouldn't be that well known around the traps. I think he has all the uh, all the ability to go uh, as far as he wants. Um, we're just seeing the emergence a bit more internationally. Amir Verdi sort of put in that um, massive squad that England have put out basically. Nine sorry players um, in that, aren't there? Yeah, yeah, which is a good thing for us, but... Um, <laughs> doesn't mean anything if it doesn't translate into any silverware. So, um, I've seen uh, Verdi. He does look uh, like he's got some talent. I mean, he can uh, he can spin the ball, can't he? Yeah, yeah, he does spin the ball, um, and he's he's very different to um, let's say a modern day spinner because he's prepared to go up and down. He wants to use the flight of the ball, uh, which gains him great dip and, and obviously big spin. So. Um, he's very unique in that respect, whereas most spinners nowadays are looking to put a bit more pace on the ball. Mm. Um, he's not as worried about putting pace on the ball, and he's quite prepared to use maybe the the more traditional, finer arts of spin. Well, it was, it was one of the questions we was actually going to bring up is that, you know, spin bowling over your career has changed quite dramatically, hasn't it? It became a big thing to be a mystery spinner, and now it seems to be going back to traditional spinners again when you look at people like... Simon Harmer and Amir Verdi coming through, and even Don Best and things like that. Yeah, I think there was a there was a period around um, Sackley and Mushtaq was the one that sort of blew the the gates open, shall we call it? Um, and um, I'd spent a bit of time with him and Ian Salisbury in my early years at Surrey, so I'd been trying to work on this Dusra, um, and then 
got lucky when I moved to Worcester to play a bit more, and that was the only reason I moved and got around the England setup. And then the word on the street was then that unless you could be a left arm spinner bowling it into the rough every now and again, or you were a finger spinner that could spin it both ways with a doosera, you you didn't have a place in international cricket. Um, and for a period of time, it messed a few guys up um, who were trying to do it, me included. I forgot about my off spinner, and I was trying to bowl this doosera for. A period sort of 2005, 6, 7-ish, um, well, 2005 and 6. And the mechanics of bowling a deuce are so different to, to a traditional off-spinner. Um, it's actually a really difficult thing to master. Um, and obviously now we see with the advent of cameras and all this sort of thing, you know, it's becoming increasingly difficult to do it with mm. the legal action. So yeah. uh, people are looking at different ways. And they're the front of the handballs now and, and sort of different current Caron balls, I think they call it the front of the hand. So um, it's all about creating some kind of deception to the batsman, an illusion, whether it be verbally, whether it be in his psyche, or whether it be off the pitch or through the air. And um, we've seen great, uh, great sort of uh, uh, masters of, of, of all, all of those uh, above um, components. And it's just a question of finding something where you can unease the batsman. How did it feel being called up to England um, after such a long period out? In 2016, you were picked up against Bangladesh. Um, what went through your mind when you got the call? It was pretty weird, really, um, because I, I, you never say never in any, anything, but it was very strange that they'd actually gone back to me because um, I think it was two or three years previous uh, to, to that sort of moment. Um, James Whitaker had told me I was going to the West Indies, um, so the, I think it was three winters previous. Um, and I'd gone to meet him up in Harrogate. I was seeing some friends up there and then came back to London. Alex Stewart knew about it. <laughs> and then I never heard anything. I wasn't called up and um, and nobody spoke to me for that sort of three-year period. So the fact that he was still chairman of selectors and had been selected was, was kind of um, a bit, well, just, just very, very strange. Very pleasant, of course it is. Uh, picked up, uh, you know, picked up another cap and what have you and, and getting involved in the big time is is what you dream of it, it doesn't matter how old you are um it's uh, it's an amazing thing and you do anything to uh, to play for your country and hopefully put in a performance to win again so um it was amazing but very surreal and very strange um and i'm married and what have you and it, we just had our first child uh -huh. um so um the little one came out to india as a, a three-month-old um, to see uh, to see Daddy, so uh, in that respect, it was it was kind of quite cool as well from a family point of view. You've just reminded me that I got married in Harrogate. <laughs> a few years ago. My wife's from there, um, and uh, I'm sure her and then the Harrogate branch family are listening to this. Um, apart from when you've got your first full cap, has there ever been a point where you've thought I've got to pinch myself? Is this really happening? Were you going maybe getting starstruck by the occasion or starstruck by? people in the dressing room or on the pitch any moments stand out um yeah i mean uh, this isn't particularly starstruck but it was a moment of pinching myself um was when i actually got my cap at surrey because i'd left surrey in all good terms i'd only left um to basically play more games because surrey were the best team in the country at the time and uh, anyway long story but um alex stewart had sort of teed it up with tom moody and it, it all worked brilliantly um but then i came back to surrey and, and managed to sort of win my my cap um and it was kind of a weird surreal moment it was sort of 14 years in the making or whatever 15 years which um uh, for anybody that's done something for a long period of time to actually get your goal at the end of it is quite an amazing thing so that was a a pretty cool point in my career for me personally and other people maybe wouldn't see it that way but i've got to be honest i've, I've done some talk sports stuff in the last few winters and um, I'm a bit of a cricket badger, so I'm, I'm walking <laughs> down the, the, the sort of hallways into the different studios and so on and so forth, and you, you walk into, say, Michael Holding or Ian Bishop, and I'm always sort of, oh, sir, uh, Mr. Holding, sir, how are you doing? You know, good morning. And, I, and I'm just so starstruck by these legends that yeah. I was in awe of watching, um, you know, Sir Vivian Richards, and I, I keep mentioning the West Indians because sort of 80s when I was growing up, there was that was the team I wanted to watch. Yeah, um, me too. But, um, yeah, amazing. No, absolutely phenomenal. I was just saying earlier on, I was at the Oval in 1980 um, for the, the England-Windies Test match when you had that team of Holding, Garner, 
um, Andy Roberts, and then you know the batting lineup of Greenwich Haynes, Richards, uh, and, and all captained by Clive Lord. And it was an amazing, yeah. amazing experience watching those guys. They replayed that the other day, I think, on um, on, on one of the cricket channels. All oh, right. Um, but in fact, do you know what? It may have been on Channel Four. Sorry, I'm picking up another station. I shouldn't be doing no, that. That's all right. I'm sure, there was an old. Um, oh, an there old was Lords eighty four was on on BBC that Two on Saturday. It. Yeah, the, the famous. Yeah, that might have been it. Don Topley yeah. catch that wasn't a catch. Oh God, yeah, Don Topley <laughs> t- coming on as a sub fielder for England. Was um, he really? Bob wow. Willis, Bob Willis dug one in short, and then Malcolm Marshall got underneath it and sort of top sliced it to backward square leg. And there's a very young Don Topley racing round the boundary fence and uh, <laughs> takes it, but his foot goes over the road. And, oh, and I'm sure, I mean, I think I've heard Don tell me that story about 50 times. <laughs> 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 and of course, because it was on TV on Saturday night, his Twitter and Facebook was going mad. I bet it was, I bet it was. <laughs> <laughs> Gareth, who's been the uh, best teammate or who's been the best player you've played with? Um... Wow, that's a, that's such a difficult question um, because uh, your career evolves. Uh, as a youngster, um, it's almost the, the senior player that you look up to that um, that put an arm around you. Um, and I was I was very lucky as a as a youngster that uh, Ian Salisbury looked after me very much okay. when I was at Surrey. Um, with Alan Butcher it was amazing, mm. um, and Mark Butcher to be fair, um, but although he was away playing with England quite a lot. Uh, and then I evolved to, to sort of Worcester for a period of time. Um, and Graham Hick was very good with Vikram Solanke, who was sort of a bit more my age, but we bounced off each other. Um, and Tom Moody was an amazing for me there. Um, and uh, Mr. Dolivera was uh, quite exceptional, if I'm brutal honest. He was probably the man at Worcester that held it all together for me. Yeah. And then coming back to Surrey again, it was Ian Salisbury and um, and then... Alex Stewart, I suppose, from start to finish, has kind of overseen everything for me um, from a from a cricketing point of view. He's he's been the man that's always sort of been there. I made my England debut when he was in the team, and um, and um, you know, series where my heart is, and probably always has been. And uh, he's very much uh, the boss, that is for sure, at, at the club. Yeah, I think he's similar to sort of the role that Graham Gooch has at Essex in in, um, in that you've got this absolutely iconic figure that represents the county and has kind of done it all within his career um but he's still very much involved and very much a benign force uh, to the youngsters and even i suppose even to some of the more senior guys on the side they would be looking to to people like alec to uh to, to sort of help them along and, and and give them advice very much and it, it is such a, a a great comparison because both achieved everything in, in the game both wonderful, wonderful players in their own right, and are still wanting to give back, not just uh, you know internationally or to the to the game, but to their clubs. And to do it with um, both men, and I, and I can say this from knowing both of them, mm. the humility in which they both do it is quite incredible for the legends that they are. Oh yeah, and um, I think that is why our our sport cricket is is a wonderful sport. Um, and I, I think um, hopefully after the. After what we find ourselves in now with the virus and everything, I hope that uh, we, you know, we all pull together and and learn the uh, the values of of these guys all over again and understand why we play this great game of ours. It's not for the, the England caps or the financials. It's because we love the game, and um, I think it comes across so well with those guys. I think it's quite incredible that they keep going. Is coaching something that you'd be thinking about when you finally um, hang your boots up? Yes, um, I'm, I'm sort of a player coach now. Yeah. So. If I'm not um, with the first team, definitely I'm. I'm sort of down there in the second team and um, trying to throw as many balls, catch as many balls, offer as much as I possibly well, just offer myself um, to to the, to the youngsters and just try and um, and be there to to make them better. Um, and I think that's that's another thing that makes me want to get up in the morning and go for the run or do the extra bit of fitness because that little bit's about me. But I, I found that I get so much from just trying to help and just being there for um, players trying to make their way um, with no agenda. I'm very lucky that when I finish my career, I'm, I'll have no regrets. I won't have been very good, but I would have had a wonderful career and really enjoyed it and done a few things I didn't think I would ever do. Um, but to have the ability to see other people going through that and hopefully help along the way is um, something that, sort of 
it burns a little bit in my heart and, and it's quite a, quite a big thing for me I think Gareth you've seen the game evolve quite a bit over your career with obviously the introduction of T20 and possibly the 100 if it goes ahead next year do you worry about Red Bull cricket and that less and less people will want to play it and more people will want to follow the money um, I worry about the way that people speak about it um, I don't worry about the, the individual games um, and I suppose because I'm still playing, I break it down, and I break it down into four-day cricket or test cricket, one-day cricket being a day, and then 2020 being three hours. Um, I can't think of any other sport where they can sort of break down their game and still have a brilliant outcome, and still have a brilliant concept. Um, and it worries me that um, after periods of time, the ECB have said that red ball is dying, test cricket is dying. In our country, it isn't. There's packed out grounds everywhere. Yeah. Um, and I think we should be championing that. There's nothing wrong with saying something that has been going on for a long period of time is still working and it's good. On the flip side of that, I know that every kid we see um, coming to the Oval, Kier Oval, wants to play 2020 cricket because that's the thing that they can associate with because that's what they play on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning. Yeah. This yeah. is all a positive for our game. I don't see how we... We need to belittle, diminish uh, any of it. We should just champion the lot. And you can bet your bottom dollar. You get a youngster going well in 2020 cricket. He wants to then play 50 over cricket. You bet your bottom dollar. Yeah. Jason Roy, we saw it. Um, he was desperate to play test cricket. And yet he's seen as a white ball player. The, yeah. the, the game, you want to try and, and, and be good at it all. So I, I think we need to take a step back and champion it all. And yeah, you will get, you will get people who... Uh, a red ball specialist or white ball that's absolutely fine um i personally think all three are here to stay and we should we should take the good out of all three i think you, if you talk to anyone that plays the game whether at club level uh, and even to the professional or whatever else i think the pinnacle if you are a cricket player uh, and i've not heard anyone suggest otherwise um is that the absolute pinnacle would be to stride down the steps at Lords in your whites with an England cap on uh, on the first day of a test match you know having to walk through the long room and all of that I still think that that's what people that are involved with cricket would want to have on their kind of cricketing CV I don't think that uh, people want to be a T20 gun for hire necessarily or even if they do they still harbour some kind of desire to uh, to be traditional yeah, I, I think it's because of the the history and the emotion that, that is attached to Test cricket. Um, and actually, you break it down, and the name of the game is actually what it does to you, does to your mind, your body, and your skill. Um, yeah. Some guys are found wanting, like myself, and other guys absolutely thrive. And this incredible ability with all those three facets to um, to entertain for a long period of time. Um, which is so demanding, really. Um, and I, I, it, it is for me, but I grew up in that era. But also with sort of taking on a, a coaching role within playing role, you've got to understand what the new generation are thinking. And if it is the way in for the new generation to play test cricket, 2020 is the be-all and end-all initially, that's absolutely fine. Mm. Because as soon as they're good at that, they will migrate to the other stuff. Uh, we've seen it with so many players, you know, you... We had Aaron Finch at our place um, for the last few years, 2020. He's supposed to be a 2020 gun fire. Yeah. Loves the fact that he's played some test cricket. And that was his dream. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you're exactly right in what you just said. I really do believe that. Good. Gareth, it's been a great pleasure having you on the show. Thanks for taking time out to join us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you on a cricket field very soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you very much for having me, man. You stay safe. Take care. You Cheers, too. Thank you. Thank well. you. Cheers. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.